Well, hello, and welcome to my little trip down road testing memory lane. Um, today I'm going to answer some more of your questions. Um, it's the beginning of 2023 now. Um, we've got our whole biking season ahead of us. Be interesting to know what everyone's going to be up to, what their plans are. Um, for me, it's a little bit of a quiet before the, the storm. The first launches don't kick off for a few weeks now. Um, but there's a lot of new bikes to, to come out. And uh, we're going to be pretty busy um, over the winter and into the spring. Um, so let's crack on with these questions. Thanks very much for sending them. I've got absolutely tons. I've got a, I've got a year's worth at least. So uh, thank you very much. Um, we'll deal with a few here today. Uh, we'll start with Jeff Lambert. Hi, Jeff. Um, is there a particular machine you're looking forward to testing in 2023? It may not be that exciting to many, but I'm looking forward to the UK road test of the new Suzuki GSX 8S. I hope you get a ride on it soon. Why does Suzuki make their bike name so complicated? Um, well, thanks for asking, Jeff. Um, I'm actually looking forward to the GSX 8S as well. I think it's um, beauty uh, is in the eye of the beholder and all the rest of it, isn't it? But I think it's one of the nicest looking of all of those parallel twin cylinder middle weights. Um, it's going to be kind of price wise there or thereabouts compared to the others. It's got lots of tech on it. Um, but I think generally Suzuki's are quite exciting to ride. They're generally pretty light, They're quite lively. I just hope um, the throttle is nice on it. They're not very good at making good throttles. Um, and yeah, I think it's a, a great machine. I don't know exactly when we're going to be testing it yet, but that's one of the things I'm really looking forward to. The other bike I was really looking forward to was the Moto Guzzi Mandelo, but we've already ridden that. And apart from that, to be honest, there aren't many standout bikes I'm really looking forward to riding. Simply because nowadays, you know, most new models are kind of the incremental changes or slightly different versions of a, another model. There's nothing kind of new and groundbreaking out there uh, for 2023. I mean, I think that Gucci probably fitted that bill. That was completely new. No one really knew what it was going to feel like or ride like. Um, and that was really good. So I'm looking forward to testing that again. But in terms of riding new bikes, I'm, I'm with you there, Jeff. I'm really looking forward to riding it. And um, as soon as we have, it will be straight up on the MCN website and you'll be able to read it in the paper and all the other magazines. So keep an eye out for that. Okay, next is from David. Uh, hello, David. No mention of Street Triple, ultimate street bike, question mark. So this was, um, we were talking about game changers game changing bikes since I've been a road tester really uh, in the last 20 years and uh, we rattled off a, through a few including the GS and, and bikes like that um, and I was thinking of the the Street Triple and the Daytona you know those three cylinder 675s and a few people have commented on the Street Triple and it's true that um, it was a game changer in the fact that it was so good the Street Triple came out in 2006, almost um, sort of under the radar because the Daytona 675 sports bike was getting so much interest. And the sort of Street Triple came along, but it immediately became an easy class leader. You know, compared to a lot of the four cylinder Japanese bikes that were around at the time, it was lighter, it was more fun, it handled impeccably, stopped beautifully. And I would say, Right up until very recently, when we get um, people right in uh, to work to, to MCN asking what bike they should go for, you know, nine times out of 10, the street triple is normally the answer to most people's questions. It's, it's fun, it's practical, it's easy to ride, it's comfortable, it just ticks so many boxes. Nowadays, it's kind of moved a bit too sporty, but the Trident 660s come in to serve the kind of newer rider. Um, but the reason I didn't put the Street Triple down in my kind of game changers is because it didn't really change the face of motorcycling at all. It became the go-to middleweight um, for people to buy, but it didn't change what anyone else was doing. 
you know, so for example, when the GS really became popular, all the other manufacturers are falling over themselves to, to make um, copies of the GS, weren't they? Um, you know, other, other bikes, the Multistrada maybe, that kind of spawned all those 17 inch wheeled adventure sports bikes, that kind of thing. So although the Street Triple is amazing, I don't think it's a game changer. But it'd be interesting to hear your comments as well. So thanks very much for that, David. Um, the next question is very interesting uh, from the flying one. Hello, the flying one, hope you've landed. Um, again, another spectacular video that was enthralling, engaging and grossing. Thank you very much. Your honesty and truth telling is contagious, which brings a quick question. Do you get any angst from manufacturers after reporting about issues or bad aspects of a new bike? Um, don't ever lose the honesty streak. It's what separates you from the herd truly commendable. Cheers. Well, thank you very much for the kind words. Um, <clears throat> that's a really interesting question. So um, we do get angst from manufacturers after um, reporting on issues. There are very, f a lot of people say it, don't they? There are very few bad bikes, but there are a lot of bikes that have been watered down from you know the, the initial idea and design to when it's manufactured. And that can be because of cost reasons, time reasons, political reasons, whatever. So some bikes aren't as good as they could be. And the manufacturers and the test riders and everyone in between knows that. But it's the manufacturer's job and particularly a press officer or PR people's job to sell that bike in its best light to everybody, from the journalist to the paying public. Um, so I think I've said before, when you're at a launch, for example, you're full of kind of salespeople for that manufacturer, ramming home the good points of the bike, and why wouldn't you? So, you know, the the PR game has changed over the years. When I started, most press officers worked directly for the manufacturers. So they were kind of really ingrained in the brand and, and knew the bikes inside out. And generally, they were bikers themselves. Um, they had a lot of experience in the industry. Over the past years, as the world of journalism has changed, where there aren't as many full-time journalists. There's a lot of kind of, of different people reviewing bikes from kind of influencers to vloggers and YouTubers and all the rest of it. Um, the kind of PR world has changed with them. So sometimes you'll be going to a launch with a PR agency and motorbikes might just be one part of their business. They might be a PR agency for watches or whiskies or whatever. So that kind of knowledge isn't there. So. Generally, the good PR people don't ask you your opinion when you're there riding a bike. Um, they, they know the score. They know they're going to read your report, you know, at some point. The, the kind of less ingrained PR people, if you like, will be always tugging at your coattails. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Which, if you really want to be critical about a bike, because we are bike critics, can be uncomfortable because you could either do a f one of a few things. You could either just grin and say, yeah, yeah, it's really nice to get yourself off the hook at the time because they shouldn't really be asking you anyway. Um, but then they'll go on to read what you've really said or you've seen on video or whatever. So you, you, you're lying to them. Or you could tell them the truth, which is uncomfortable. Or well, there's a few times where I've told the truth and um, the PR people will be, you know, say if I've said, well, the bike, uh, the rear shock is too soft or whatever. They'll go, okay, I'm gonna go and bring along the person who designed the chassis on this bike, the head of the chassis team. And you're like, For f and then they come and talk to you and, and basically try and change your opinion. They'll say, no, the shock's fine with this, 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 but you both know that that shock cost them £2.50 and it's not as good as an Olin shock that costs a £1,000. So there is kind of, there is a reason that it doesn't work as well as it should. So, um, yeah, launches can be quite difficult about that. Some manufacturers will kind of ask why you thought a certain thing once they've seen it published, uh, published in the paper or YouTube or whatever. 
just to get feedback, which is fine after the event. I don't think they should be asking you during a launch. Um, but the thing that really worries me is when manufacturers say nothing. If you've given them a bad review and they don't want to know why, and you kind of think to yourself, well, how are they ever going to make that product better if they don't listen to constructive criticism? Which is something a lot of people say about our world now. You know, when there's a lot of people going to launches for different reasons for other people, and they'll, they'll say this bike's brilliant, or they just go there to have their picture taken with the bike. You know, short term, it's good for the manufacturers because they're all saying nice things. But long term, I don't know if it's a good thing. I think it pays to be critical in a constructive way. You know, we're all here, MCN and all the bike magazines are there generally to promote biking because it's an amazing thing to do um, and we all get a lot of enjoyment about it. So, you know, just to go along and be an absolute mizog isn't what you need to do. But if you see something isn't quite right, then I think you should you should definitely say it. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question, Flying One. And, you know, I always have that kind of little bit of anxiety when I go to a launch and I get on a bike and there's things that aren't right. And I think, oh, right. You know, it, it gets complicated, but that that's the job. That's the job. Um, but no, great question. Thank you very much. The next question is from Jonathan Mackey. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, I'm sad to see the demise of sports bikes. I know they are completely impractical for the road these days, and I'm a bit old and soft in the middle to ride one now, but they represent the good old days for me, and I'd have one just for the nostalgia. My question to you would be, how do you feel about the current trend towards fewer cylinders on bikes? As a recent returner, I've been disappointed with the prevalence of twins in the 600 to 1000 cc bikes and the way testers and reviewers wax lyrical about them. I want a howling inline four please, but then I'm old enough to remember being sad when two strokes went away and we had to have four cylinder four strokes. We soon got over that. But that's a great question, Jonathan. Um, sports bikes, what's left of them are moving away from four cylinder 600s and thousands, aren't they? It's all the new stuff's twins. Um, there's the R7, there's the RS660. Um, there's going to be an R9, hopefully, which will be a triple. I'm really looking forward to that. But those old four cylinder bikes are kind of, they've disappeared and it is a real shame. Um, I'm all for fewer cylinders. I mean, um, the Panigale V2 is amazing, fantastic to ride. Um, but, and also the KTM 890 Ducar, fantastic bike. But generally, parallel twin CC, uh, parallel twin cylinder sports bikes are wrapped in chassis that aren't as good as a proper superbike chassis. So take the RS660 as an example. It's a great little bike, but it's got very basic suspension. And the brakes aren't as kind of tactile as you'd like. So it isn't so much the engine that makes these bikes feel a little bit, uh, you know, nostalgic for what used to be around. It's kind of the whole of the chassis. That's why that KTM 890 Duke R is so good because it's got fantastic suspension, fantastic tires, and it's an exciting bike to ride. I think you can make a parallel twin as exciting as anything. You just need to make it light, crisp handling and fun. Um, granted, parallel twins aren't as exciting as a cross-plane crank or a V-twin or a screaming four, um, but I think it's the way it's the way the world's going now. They're cheaper to make, they're not as powerful, um, and the power puts a lot of people off, doesn't it? Who needs a 200 bhp plus superbike? Um, but I'd like to see these new generation of twins be wrapped in a proper kind of exciting chassis, but not one that's too small. You know, we've said before, Blades and Aprilia RSVs, they're just too small for normal people. Um, but no, that's that's a great question. It'd be interesting to see where it goes, but I'm really looking forward to riding that Yamaha R9 if and when it appears, because that should be, you know, that should be the spiritual successor to the GSX-R 750, if it happens, I think. And that's one of my favorite bikes. Um, but great question, thank you very much. And finally, Pete Reeves has said, Merry Christmas, 
well, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you. Um, it's right at the beginning of 23. I hope you have a good year. Uh, great vid as usual. Um, where you were sat towards the end of my last video, there was a little bit of Keith Flint fire start, a hairstyle going on behind you. Well, there must have been <laughs> something else, um, which made me chuckle. R.I.P. Absolutely. What, what a great guy. What a great guy. Sadly missed. Um, did you ever race for him once? Cheers again, Pete. Well, thanks for your question. Um, Keith Flint was, we all, we, all, we all know who he is. He's just in that amazing band of Prodigy, full of energy, probably the soundtrack to a lot of people's lives as they were growing up as it was mine. He was a massive petrol head and um, kind of did a lot with bikes. So when the Firestarter album came out, he, he he used to be in the bike press quite a lot. He had a, a Red Bull Ducati. I think he was involved with Red Bull team in some way. And he's like, he's loved bikes from day dot from, you know, before he was in a band. He used to muck about on mopeds and he's had bikes all the way through his life. And I was lucky enough to meet him. We did a thing in 2009 at Castle Coombe. It was a, a Crescent Suzuki kind of day. We went down there, we rode some of the super bikes. We had an interview with Gintoli and Keith was there. And I did a few laps with Keith, interviewed him um, for MCN. And you can still see that interview online on MCN's website if you search for it. It's a really nice interview and you'll see his passion for bikes. Um, and we kind of just got chatting. Um, I saw him again at another Crescent event in Silverstone. And then bizarrely, we became friends for a, a, you know, a few years until unfortunately he passed away. Um, and that was a real surreal time in my life. Um, he, he ended up coming to um, some of the track days I was doing, some of the races I was doing. He actually turned up to watch me race at Brands Hatch the day after they played at the Milton Keynes Bowl. Um, 2010 or 11 or something like that, which was, can you imagine that? <laughs> he said had his eye makeup on from the night before. It was incredible. Um, and then he started getting more involved with racing. So he, he set up a sort of a, a low level endurance racing team, which my friend Paul Berriman uh, raced with him. Keith is on a new GSXR, supported by Paul Denning at Crescent. Um, then my friend Paul Berriman was on a GSXR K3, I think. Um, that kind of evolved. He got a little bit more serious. He, he, that turned into team traction control racing. And my brother raced with him for quite a while. Um, I did a few kind of standing rides um, with Keith as well, which is amazing. Um, and that kind of evolved. That got bigger and bigger. He had uh, Steve Mercer riding for him. Um, and eventually they ended up going to the TT. Ian Hutchinson rode for him. Um, he had a British super sport team uh, and it, it got quite big, got quite big. And um, yeah, his, his kind of passion remained throughout. And uh, I ended up becoming quite good friends with him. And it was really, really sad um, that it kind of had to end like that. Um, yeah, it's real, really sad. But let me, let me tell you my top three sort of Keith fond memories in the time I knew him. So number the first one was staying at his house once, staying in his spare room and having to take his MTV Music Awards off his spare bed so I could sleep. <laughs> I mean, that's surreal, quite heavy as well. Um, he came along to Zolder in Belgium. We did a, me and Paul Berriman did an endurance race and that was attended by some of my friends as well, uh, Paul Baker, uh, in a no budget cup. We had a guest ride. We were riding an old FZR 600 Yamaha and it was a two hour endurance race. We ended up finishing second and Keith did every single one of my pit boards. So you had the fire starter hanging over the pit wall. Every lap, I couldn't, couldn't believe it. <laughs> and then the third Keith story that I'll always remember is I went to see him play once stayed at the side of the straight stage, which was incredible. And um, during their encore, while the rest of the band went off and got a drink or whatever, um, just before they came back on again, 
Keith came over and started chatting to me about motorbikes on the side of the stage and what slicks he should be using on his GSX-R the next time he went out. So, I mean, that gives you an idea of what an absolute petrol head and, and his love of bikes. And he was such a kind, caring, amazing person that was, you know, at odds with that kind of uh, the, the wild, the wild child style that he portrayed. But yeah, that was, that was really sad. But um, yeah, it's a great question, Pete. Thanks very much for that. Um, and that's it. Thank you all very much for watching. I think my next video, I'll dig out another little story from MCN and um, talk you through what was going on at the time. But again, thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.